Um, so we're introducing what we regard as a new category of security solution, which has really been designed from the ground up to address a particular issue that we all in this room have. And that is to how we can authenticate securely whilst not introducing, reducing the amount of friction that that has for the organization when we look at productivity. So I wanted to spend just a few minutes looking at some of the drivers for that, some of the drivers for looking at this new technology, what lies behind that. Is this something that is important now but may go away in the future? So you've got an idea of that. Then looking uh, at what are the alternative options? What is it you're doing? And all of, you, all of you will be familiar with them. So quite a quick review of that. And then talking a little bit about the solution. Don't plan to go into that in a huge amount of detail here, but just wanted to give you an idea of what it's like and then provide you with some of the feedback that we have from customers. So first of all, the, the primary underlying driver, and I know you're going to hear more about it tomorrow, is around Farm 4. There's a tremendous amount of advantage that you can get from that. Digitization, moving towards new technologies, going beyond that into big data analysis, looking at the procedures that you have, making those more efficient. Moving on from that into artificial intelligence. So maybe it's an ability to design new treatments for rare forms of diseases and using all of that technology in a very, very positive way. There is a consequence to using some of that technology. So as you know, uh, over many years, the manufacturing process was often completely air-gapped, separate from any other systems from the internet, wasn't connected to others. But as we move more towards the digital side, then some of that separation goes away. You're now looking at internet of things, connections to the internet, etc. So that introduces to it an increasing uh, area, surface area, that people could actually look at from an attack point of view, if you like. Uh, broadly speaking, in the industry, it's not a specific pharma issue, but I'm sure we're all very much aware of increasing uh, threats, uh, increasing attacks that happen to organizations, both from the point of view of people accessing or trying to get into your systems to steal data, maybe some of the intellectual property that you have, but more and more we're starting to see the motivation for people changing. So in the same way that uh, we as an industry are moving towards digitization, the same level or perhaps quicker levels of advancement have happened on the dark side of the web. So it's much, much easier for people to now launch particular attacks. Today's normal PC can crack passwords in a matter of a few seconds, which wasn't always the case. So it's easier for people to actually launch some of these attacks. I touched on the motivation for that. So yes, there's a financial motivation. One of the biggest areas of attacks that people have is ransomware. I'm sure you're all familiar with some breaches that happened in the past couple of years. <coughs> some companies went dark for a number of weeks because they weren't actually able to to produce product, but the motivation is, is growing. So because it's become so easy, you now have some people that may, they may be upset with some products that you produce, the effect on the family. It's easy for them to launch that. You may have disgruntled employees who may decide to go down this route. So the security aspect together with the digitization is something that all the companies that I'm speaking with taking very seriously. They're looking to improve that level of security. The other driver that we have behind that, you know, in a very highly regulated industry, is the need to be very compliant with what's going on. If you just look at some of the trends that are happening in terms of needing to provide greater level of granularity to various different regulators to comply, but it's also to do with ensuring that we're producing good product, it's repeatable, um, and that the the solution, the end point that we're producing is at the highest quality level that we have. Uh, this may be the case as well. So some of our customers have shared with us the growth that they've had in e-signatures, for example, part of digitization that's continuing to march up over a period of time. So I don't think that the need for compliance is going to go away. I don't think the need for security is going to go away. That 
compliance then causes some challenges. I mentioned at the beginning the idea that there's some friction there, uh, what that happens with people. So organizations that we're working with, particularly in the manufacturing side, particularly if it's associated with uh, uh, systems they have, EBR systems in place, there can be hundreds of signatures per operator per day. The average that we're seeing is actually 100 per operator. But we have been in organizations where 300 or more per person is signed per day. And that can introduce you know, a lot of friction uh, that's available for them. So again, look at what are the technologies avail available for that? So the traditional one, the username and the password, uh, it is what uh, most people are using. People are starting to look at other forms of uh, technology authentication. The username and password side, if you take the, the idea that you need to improve security, the only way to do that is to make the password longer, uppercase, lowercase, more complex, change it more frequently, and that introduces a tremendous amount of friction. Not only people having to stop and type it in at the time that people being locked out because they've forgotten about it, that can be a real challenge to keep up with the security that you need to have. If you look at uh, multi-factor authentication devices, so a, a stronger step up, if you like, from just having a username and password, the challenge with the majority of those multi-factor devices is that they're, they're not attached to you. So, so sort of walked away, somebody else potentially can pick it up and use it. Is it actually you who's to perform that transaction? In addition to most of the environments that I come across on the manufacturing side, you can't take other things in there because of the risk of contamination. So there's a real challenge with those. And then biometrics. So uh, nearly all the companies that I speak to uh, are looking at biometrics generally. Uh, you may be aware of a, an issue that there is with biometrics and that it's, yeah, it's a very strong form of identifying who somebody is because we have biometrics, it's very unique. Challenge with that is in most systems, if those biometrics are then held in a database somewhere, so you do a comparison, what happens if that gets hacked? And on the 14th of August this year, you may have read about that taking place, where over a million biometric records were stolen, compromised. You can't clearly change your biometrics. So it is a good form of authentication, but there's some downsides. And particularly in Germany, uh, the workers' councils that I've been to there, they, they are very unhappy about the concept of providing their biometric uh, to the company that they may do something with it. So in the case of NIMI, we are biometric, but on the, on the band, the biometric that we're using is a fingerprint, and it only is stored here. It doesn't go across the network at all. And in fact, it's not actually an image of the fingerprint. It's a derived uh, template from that. So even if you manage to break into it, you can't reproduce a fingerprint from that. So we are a biometric, enabled, and multi-factor authentication device very different solution that we have compared to anything else that's, that's actually out there. So as I've alluded to, uh, multi-factor authentication device, you don't need to have passwords with them. So potentially, you look at doing away with your username and passwords to be able to log on to systems, to log off systems when you're not there, to do e-signing. Uh, we're starting to do trials now using the same band physical access for a range of different use cases. So this platform that we've got is capable of doing many, many more things. At the moment, the deployments that we have are to do with logging in and out of systems and applications and e-signing. And the experiences that we have from customers, which I'll talk to you about, really are based on those. But there's other areas that we will move into in time. So BAND itself is a security token. This is the multi-factor device that we have. It's biometric, the only way to enable this to switch it on is, this is my band assigned to me, the only way to switch this on is for my biometric to do that. It can't be used by anybody else. And I'll talk about some of the other sensors that are there in a moment. In addition to that, we then monitor that it's always on the person. So as soon as you take it off, deactivates, it's dead, it can't be used by anybody else. 
that's a high level summary of what the, what the solution is. So uh, I'll touch on this a little bit. Um, so there's the band itself, and because it's a physical aspect, you know, a lot of people focus in on that. But I just put the slide up just to emphasize it's more than just band. There's back-end service software, there's client software. So this is an enterprise security solution. So when the band is being used, uh, we are continually monitoring that it is the correct band associated to the user, that they have authority and permission to use it. So these elements all work together to provide this closed loop security solution. The band itself, as you can see from mine, primary form of authentication is the fingerprint that we have. And this particular fingerprint reader is the same kind of one that you have on a smartphone. So very well established technology, very reliable, very accurate, and around it that metal bezel is one of the ECG sensors. So when I put this on my wrist and I put my finger on it to authenticate to it, I'm also touching this, this metal bezel. And on the back of the band, that round circle, is the other ECG sensor. So when I authenticate to it, it's forming a closed loop through my heart to the band. So in order to authenticate and put it on, it's checking not just my fingerprint, but also am I human, am I alive, most of the time I am, and uh, checking that it's not being uh, put on another device, that there's only one person there. So there's, there's no way that you can accidentally authenticate to this. If I put this off, if, if I took it off, it switched off, put it on a table, and just put my finger on it, it wouldn't authenticate because it's not on me. So Andrew, yeah. what if I go on break and put it on my buddy's wrist and he wears two? Uh, one band to one person. Okay. And it will recognize another band being on that person? Uh, so the other, so there's only one band to one person. You could theoretically have two bands if you wanted to, I don't know why you have that. But uh, it's only one band to one person. Does it have a double signature? This has happened when I've heard of it. Where the guy goes on break and says, here, sign in for me because I'm going to use our new password. Now he can hand his watch, put it on his right wrist, his left wrist, right? Hand. So that if you can, actually, you probably didn't hear that, but it, it vibrates as soon as I took it off. It's now switched off. It doesn't work. I can't give it to you. But you can put it on my wrist and it holds it again, right? Uh, not very easily. Not very easily. Because when I put my finger on here, it's doing this closed loop. So it's not something that you could, uh, there's no way that somebody could accidentally give it to somebody else. If they were to try and defeat it, they'd have to actively collude to do that. So it's a use case, right? You can't be wrong, but it's... Yes, and it requires active collusion to do that. Okay. We have you know, many safety policies, and one of those is you can't wear any jewelry in the yeah. plant. How do you get around that? In so is there like a ripaway band that you can get? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, that, that comes up quite often. And uh, there's a couple of different views. It depends on your organization. So some people are prepared to change their SOPs because this is now seen as an industrial component quite a new job. Some people have to do that. Some others, because it doesn't tell the time, they don't regard it as a watch or jewelry. So they get around it that way. In most cases, this works through uh, PPE, so gloves, gowns, and it's not actually exposed at all in the collection environment. And that seems to satisfy most people. I'm sure there were cases where it's just not going to work, but in the majority of cases, the fact that it's underneath protective clothing seems to Yeah, yeah. So this is a, so it's designed as a standard industry watch band size. So we could replace that. So what I've got on here is different to one of the pictures. So they're replaceable. So you could replace it with something that either tears away, or if you don't want it to tear away. So it depends on what the particular. So the band isn't part of it at all. No, no. It's just a, it's just a standard strap. So it's hypoallergenic, all of those kinds of things. Uh, but it's it's replaceable. The strap that goes on it. 
Um, Andrew, it so it uses Bluetooth 5? Is it good? Does it use Bluetooth 5? It's using BLE. 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 Blue, blue. Uh, but DLE, okay, good. Yeah. What what level of security? One to four. So we have a security protocol written to fix 102, 104-2 okay. that then runs a security protocol over that, and I'll explain how that. Okay. Well, I'll explain how it works now. Okay. So <laughs> each band is unique. Uh, during a secure manufacturing process, there's a certificate that's burnt onto this band, so it's unique. There is only one of them, and we. We communicate via NFC uh -huh. and uh, via Bluetooth. So the NFC part, we use that to show intent. So you need an NFC reader. And it's kind of if, you've, uh, if you do contactless credit cards, uh -huh. you tap your card against it, you tap your band against it to show intent to sign. That in its, in its own right isn't sufficiently secure because as you probably know, you could record that, replay it from the phone if you wanted to. Yeah. It's not completely secure. So what we also do, and this is why I mentioned the server software, is when that tap happens over this secure protocol that we have, we're doing a PKI certificate inspection. So the band is checking that it's talking to a genuine NIMI server, the NIMI server checking that it's talking to a genuine NIMI band, that is assigned to this individual that can only be switched on by this individual's biometric. And that's why we think of it as a closed loop energy by security solution. Um, a couple of other things on the band. So because it communicates this way, it, it works through gowns and gloves, so it doesn't need to be exposed to clean run environments, that kind of thing. Once it's on and enabled, we then have these three different sensors that work together to determine that it's still on somebody. So we've got capacitance through the skin, we've got light, and we've also got movement. So they work together continually. As soon as it's taken off, it switches off cannot be picked up by using it by anybody else, can only be switched back on if the user's biometric, which is used to the individual. So it was likely your environment to put it on, put on your PPE and then... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you don't have to use your fingerprint each time for the location? There you go. Yep, so you absolutely. You touch your fingerprint, put it on, and say, okay, I'm now using my band. So now, you know, put your PPE on, you can tap through it. Well, you don't use your fingerprint each time. No. no. The one yeah. Okay. So, what, so one of the taglines that we've got is always on authentication. So you authenticate to it, which is on. It's now effectively broadcasting who you are. You do not need to re-authenticate for the rest of your shift until you take the band off. And then how close do you have to get to the sensor to, to do the signature? It's, it's, it's the same. It's, it's really the same as a Apple Pay or Samsung. So you know, you're tapping against it. It's, it's so about... It's probably less than a centimeter, that kind of thing. But we've got that, so if you've got multiple people wearing it, when they're walking past, they're not signing as they walk past. You've got to show intent to sign. Um, the Bluetooth piece of it as well gives us some other properties. So in addition to the security aspect, we have presence. So uh, one of the use cases is if you're working away, I'm sure you all have standard operating procedures, Say the user has to log, up, log out and they go away. Occasionally, that doesn't happen, occasionally. So when people walk away, when you go out of Bluetooth range, you now know that you're not there, you can set the system up to close, lock down, whatever it may be. Because it's Bluetooth, you know, that varies. So probably the more interesting use case of using that is if you have a timer on the system, which a lot of people do which is if it's not been used for a while, it shuts down because it assumes the user has walked away. If they're still there, and we know that they're there, then we'll stay open so you get away from that frustration of people having to log back in even though they haven't actually moved away. And there's other things that we can do with Bluetooth as well, but so just focus on what we what customers use today. And how that works with the various different systems, so whether it's uh, an MES system, HMI systems, uh, limbs, uh, we're, in, we're in, implemented in a range of different environments. The, the ways that they're typically implemented is either there's some kind of middleware that sits between NIMI and the applications that you've got, so you don't have to change those applications. You do a direct integration, and uh, we'll be showing what, what POMs have done later on, or uh, you use industry standards. So we'll support more and more industry standards, the one that's 
have a go for authentications 502. So if you had any applications as for 502, you can use NIMI to log into them. So there's quite a number of applications that, that do that, a growing number. So this is the chain of trust. I sort of addressed this a little bit earlier on with the, with the, uh, the Bluetooth secure protocol. Effectively, there's a process where there's an enrollment process uh, that goes on with an end user to a band. That's a one-time thing that happens. And normally that process is done where you'll have maybe someone from IT security, they'll have an enrollment workstation, they'll ask the operator to come up, visually check you are who you say that you are, ask them to enter their corporate credentials or you know, the active, active directory credentials, which is what the company trusts as the proof of who they are, and then given a, a band, which one's unique with the certificate that's burnt on, at that time, are asked to enroll to the band where you put your fingerprint on and then you move it the same way that you would do with a smartphone. And that binding takes about five minutes, and that binding is then done on a permanent basis, permanent commas, because if somebody leaves, you do a security wipe and you assign some bills. And that enrollment only needs to take place once. So you know it's that individual with this band. You need band, you need person. The only way of switching it on is with the biometric. It's the only way. What we then do is do this NFC tap, show intent, we're using it for signing. And during that process, we then have this Bluetooth uh, secure protocol that runs, and it's using PKI certificate inspection. We know that we're talking to a genuine maybe server, the server knows this is a genuine band, and we link in with identity and access management systems that you have. So in NIMIT, we don't hold any information, we just hold this unique band is associated with this user. That's the, the only information that we have. The rest of it, in terms of who has access to what, your existing systems. So we just drop into your existing systems. There's no forklift upgrade the infrastructure that you need for them to work. A question? Yeah. Um, what does the other side look like? The, is there a dongle that connects to the computer or is the like, for example, we have bank clients for our workstations. Yep. So they don't have Bluetooth. So is the Bluetooth provided by that dongle, or how does that? Yeah, so we have a Bluetooth dongle. So thank you for the question. I should have uh, answered that. So even though it's Bluetooth, it's, it's standard Bluetooth yeah. protocol. But we need a dongle that we use, because most PCs, the way that you use Bluetooth is it's a pairing between one person to a machine. We don't want that to be able to work at any machine that they work for. So we provide a little Bluetooth dongle with that. And then for the NFC side, it's typically a USB plug-in uh, NFC uh, reader. Uh, and we're implemented in a number of environments where they have thin clients, so whether they're iGels or, or whatever it may be. So we support Citrix, RDP, Thin Manager, a number of other thin management solutions that are out there. But at the point that you're using it, you do need some kind of reader Bluetooth dongle. That is. Did you say it's two dongles or one? Two. You can get them combined together. You can get the readers for clean room environments. So there's a number of different options there. And typically, when we go to a customer site and we see what their environment is, we can advise these are the range of options that you've got and we figure out with them the best way to. So, if I could jump, maybe, I don't know, right? But say I'm Joe user, I come to work at my company, first day, they go to the end they the operator, and jump up to that. They're going to issue one of these to me as an operator, that's in mine until some point in the right? Do the users typically leave that at work each day on some kind of a charging stand, yeah. or do they have to go home with them? Yeah. yeah, so it depends on the use case. So, if it's a manufacturing environment, particularly if it's a clean room type of environment, then it's normally stored in a gouging area. Um, often they'll attach this micro USB charger, attach a micro USB charger, they'll put a band in their locker, they'll take it out and put it on. If it's a labs environment, which is more office based, and sometimes they have it just at their office, at the desk that they use, um, we haven't had anybody yet asking the employee to take it home with them as charge, but we couldn't do that. 
Um, that. So, so some of the feedback that we've got from customers. So this is the enrollment process that I mentioned. So five minutes to enroll is a one-time thing that you need to do. So you, there's this binding that takes place between this band and me, and the only person that can put this on. Then when you go to work, you go to shift, you put the band on, you authenticate to it, it takes about 15 seconds, it's now on. It's now broadcasting your identity, you don't need to authenticate for the rest of the day. Gowns, gloves on, whatever it is, you go back to work. So you take it off, you don't need to authenticate the rest of the day. I buy the passwords, I buy the usernames. And then to do the actual login, the sign off, you do a tap, it takes a couple of seconds maybe, and that's what it is. So the feedback that we have from customers, the average time saving that they're finding for um, using NIMI to do e signing as opposed to typing username and password, is 10 seconds. So it varies quite a lot, and the reason why it varies is it depends on customer's password policies. If it's a long, complex case budget, then the saving is bigger. Um, if they're wearing gloves and they can have more mistakes, so they're using tablets, is it a virtual keyboard, is it one with real feedback? So all of those things uh, impact that. So we have some customers that are getting savings as 35 seconds per signature that they do. We have some that are getting more six seconds because they have an easier policy in place. But on average, it's 10 seconds. And I mentioned before, the average um, number of e signings that we're seeing, particularly in the MES side, is 100 operators per day. So when you then start looking at uh, the potential productivity savings that you can get from that. So this example is using 10 seconds, 100 signing per day. It's using the average hourly rate of $40. And that's coming out to those savings per annum per person. And then if you look at things like uh, if you no longer have to do password resets, you can eliminate the cost of, of doing that. And that's not taking into account productivity time. So most of the customers range between two minutes to two hours to do a password reset, which is time that people maybe not actually able to. 15 uh, projects with customers at the moment. 10 of those 15 companies are in the top 20 pharma companies in the world. Uh, we're installed in uh, MES, manufacturing environment, packaging, labs environment. We're installed in GMP environments. So there's a range of uh, systems that we have that are deployed. So in addition to the technology that we have, we are helping people go through validation processes. We've got a series of templates and documents of project methodology and process to help them go through that. So we're seeing really quite fantastic feedback from, uh, from the customers. And one of the areas that you know, they, they delight in telling us is sometimes, and I don't think anybody in this room will ever but that sometimes uh, the IT teams or IT systems are regarded by the operators in not too favorable a light. Sometimes, <laughs> just, just saying sometimes. The feedback that we've had is when they don't introduce an infant in America, this is the best thing ever, particularly if they're having to sign hundreds of times a day. So really strong end user feedback would be through workers' councils. Um, really, really positive. And then super exciting thing for me, delighted for here, thank you to come along is this. So I will pick up on the last point on the previous slide. Okay. Uh, if you want to get, yep. uh, easy to implement. I mean, I can speak from a product vendor standpoint. This was one of the easiest uh, applications for us to integrate with. Uh, there's a breeze to, you know, the, the APIs and whatnot. I mean, it's so powerful that we could just tie the knots and get it to work within a matter of hours. But we took a few more days to make sure it's all working right. <laughs> so, so Trisha, will you put this in the Palms 5.5? It's on there, I'm going to show you now. It's in Palms 5, MES 5.5? No, 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 no. 500. So will you put it in the Palms MES 5.5? Yes. <laughs> we, we can actually. You could. But uh, it, may, it may take much more effort than uh, what it took for us in Palms. But we, again, we cannot do it in 400 either. We tried in 400 last year and it didn't work very well. 
Andrew, I have a question. Andrew, on your slide, I know Richard was asking questions about dedicated bands for person, but have you ever had the use case where people just have a pool of bands? Because you said it only takes five minutes to do an enrollment. Yeah, you, so you could. So in the morning or at the start of the shift, you could re-enroll bands, right? Yeah, you, you could do that for sure. Well, technically, you can do it. Okay. Uh, what I've seen is people not wanting to do that, so as you have this really strong non-repudiation. Yeah. You know, there's a binding between a band yeah. and this individual, and you know for sure it was that individual that did it. So that's the main reason for that. There are some practical differences, uh, challenges with doing enrollment every day. So instead of going to your locker, taking a band out and putting it on, yeah. you now have to get it and go to an enrollment workstation and go through an enrollment process. Yeah. And if your enrollment process, so we technically, we can set it up so people can self-enroll. You may not want to do that. You may want to have a security officer. So there's some yeah, practical... Yeah, so there's some, so, so some practical stuff in that. There is a use case for that. If you bring in contractors for rework or something like that, I mean, there is a use case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that situation, what we would normally do is provide a pool of additional bands that you use, particularly for contractors. Uh, we have audit blocks in the system, so every band we know who we're selling to at what period of time. So you, you can you could re enroll on a regular basis or have a pool of contractors. Or so just for granted, I mean, if we were to put like three to five hundred of these in a plant, what kind of cost range? Uh, I mean, it, 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 these things. Don't you love these open source questions? So, the, the cost of the bands is a few hundred dollars per year. So, annual charge? Yeah. Okay. So, we had a presentation. So, one of the projects that we did, they ran a pilot, uh, it's in a packaging line. Uh, 60 users deployed GMP environment using NIMI. Uh, they, they presented back to the findings that they had. Um, they, they produced a report for their, their internal management meeting, but they were very kind and presented it back to us. They had an ROI of five months. So what was the choice, I mean, what was the reason for going with an annual purchase rather than a one-time purchase? So there's, there's a, so there's a couple of things. Uh, so the way that we charge is on a per user basis, and we wrap everything in into that single charge per person. The other side is that this is a, a, effectively a platform product, so I've alluded to additional functionality that's coming out. So you would get all of that with this annual charge. When you do start off and you pay your initial subscription, the band does become yours. So it is a, it is a, it's like a hardware capital that's wrapped into these subscription fees. And then you're paying for a right to use and a right to have this new functionality that comes onto that. I have a question. To, um, was there a question? Yeah. Are there any plans to submit any proposals for this year? Um, yeah. So we are looking at that. Um, so it is a question that comes up. You know, I'm not going to lie, it is possible to cheat pretty much any IT system that's out there. And what we have at the moment is something that provides a very strong level of assurance. So going forward, there'll be um, further. So some of the things that we're looking at, it's not that today, is for example, can we tell that the fingerprint and the ECG are for the same person? For example. What could even be like um, when you activate it? There can't be any other active band within like 70 or whatever the arm span is. Yeah. Along. Yeah. Along. But we we will look at all of those things. But so far, through all the companies that we've uh, been to, and their quality teams, their security teams, they're all totally fine with how it is at the moment. And we'll improve. And this is actually being used by Yes, yes, it is. It's usually better than the alternative, right? Yeah. Yeah. I can't yeah. tell you how many times I've audited a place and I walk in, the first four pages of that um, record are already filled out, they're signed in. Um, I haven't started running, but I've seen it. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Are you looking at the use case of being able to work in the room at that time? We are. Uh, we're not quite there at the moment. Uh, we're looking at things like you know, when you're introducing the secret components, making sure the right people are in there. We're looking at various health and safety aspects. So if there's an emergency, knowing that people have come out of a room or that they're in a room. So there's a range of things that we're looking at there. I didn't want to. I don't want to sell you something we don't have. So everything I'm talking about today is exactly what we have today. But our roadmap going forward is to incorporate a lot of these other things. Better detection that it's on the person, other use cases, physical access, a whole range of different things because the way we've designed it, we can have more and more capability to it. I'd just like to say if there are use cases uh, that customers want to have, uh, bring them up. That's not a commitment, by the way. That's <laughs> <laughs> give us your feedback. Give us your suggestions. In the same way Krishna says, you know, we want to hear from you because yes. this is how we drive our product forward. This is how we know what you want in the product and what you should need. So, yeah, let us know and we can work towards uh, supporting some, some of those pieces. Actually, I have, I have a question. I'm already excited. This is the shiny object for me these days. <laughs> I think we need to move forward with the demonstration. Yeah. Yeah.